So you might have seen sockets before in a computer networking course, but nevertheless, since they're also an operating system instruction, it makes sense to discuss them here. So uh, sockets are general communication endpoints in a computer network. And this computer network, as a special case, can simply consist of a single computer where processes, as long as you have some sort of network stack, like a TCP IP stack, uh, on your computer can actually communicate uh, using uh, these sockets, even if you don't have multiple machines. Sockets are bidirectional, so you can communicate in both directions, and they're buffered, so the operating system provides some sort of buffer space for socket communication. Sockets are a method to abstract from details of the communication system. So, for example, if you use a socket-based application, you don't have to care which communication protocol is underlying your socket. So if it's an internet connection using TCP IP, if it's a local connection or some more exotic stuff that you can imagine. And to do this, sockets are described by a so-called domain, which is a protocol family of a socket, a type of a socket, and a protocol this socket uses underneath. So when you have sockets, you can have several processes here communicating over a network, and these sockets indicate certain connections. So process one can send information using a socket to process two, and to process three, and on the same side, process two can also send information using a socket to process three, and this can happen on a single machine, but these three processes could also run on different computers on the internet, for example. So sockets can have different domains, so different uh, yeah, environments they can run on. One domain is the so-called Unix domain. So this is for running on a single Unix system, for communicating within a single Unix system. So the Unix domains or Unix domain sockets work like bidirectional pipes, and they're usually created as a special file in the file system. And since they're only available in one file system, you can only use them to communicate within one and the same system. Now, a very common use case for sockets is so-called internet domain. So this is used for inter-computer -com communication using the internet protocols. But there are additional domains available, uh, depending on your system, maybe an Apple Talk domain or a DECnet domain for uh, different uh, communication protocols that have been invented over the last 20 or 30 years and which have mostly fell out of use uh, nowadays. So they're obsolete, but still in some circumstances, they may, might still be available. So domain determines the protocols that can be used for a socket. So for example, for the internet domain, you could uh, either use a TCP IP connection, so a reliable transport, or you could also use an unreliable transport, a UDP IP connection. And then domains also determine how you address nodes on your network or in your communication. So for the internet domain, you would use the IP address and in addition, a so-called port number because uh, you need this port number to differentiate between different processes running on this one computer with this IP address, uh, where its Unix domain, for example, has different ways to address nodes uh, that want to communicate. So types and protocols of sockets uh, depend on whatever domain you're using. So the most important socket types are stream-oriented, connection-oriented, and reliable but you can also have message-oriented and unreliable connection and message-oriented and reliable connections. So for the internet domain, you can have the TCP IP protocol, which is stream connected and connection oriented and also a reliable transport. So you have a, a guarantee of correct ordering of packets. You have, uh, even if they make up a stream and you have uh, the uh, guarantee that if the data arrives, it arrives undisturbed. Whereas in UDP IP, you have some message oriented protocol, which is connectionless. So you just kick off a message here, essentially because you don't get feedback on it. This is unreliable. So if a message gets lost, it's lost. It could also get duplicated using uh, when some error on the network occurs. So repeat it. Uh, the order of packets can be garbled if different packets choose different ways over a network. But for even for UDP, your packet limits are maintained. So either a complete packet arrives or a complete packet disappears or a complete packet arrives but with changes to the data but it cannot happen that a packet is usually split into two using a UDP connection. Specifying a protocol is often redundant if we know the domain because domains are closely connected to protocols. So how do we program sockets? 
Now to create a socket, you use the socket sys call and uh, you pass it the domain you're interested in, the type you're interested in, and the protocol. And the return value of your socket call is a file descriptor as you would get from an open system call, for example. Uh, assigning addresses uh, works as a separate step. So if you create a socket, you usually don't generate an address. So you need to assign or bind an address using the bind system call. So here you say you have a certain socket that you just generated using your socket system call. So you pass this socket file descriptor here as the first parameter. And then you pass a pointer to a buffer, which contains a structure socket adder, which is they're well dependent on the protocol you use. So IPv4 addresses takes different uh, space than uh, other addresses. And you also pass it the length, so the number of bytes contained in this uh, buffer here. And uh, you have uh, different uh, information in this struct, uh, struct sock adder in. So you have a field that indicates the family, which is AF address family INET. So we have internet family protocols. We also get the port number uh, we want to connect to, which is a 16-bit number on your system. And you give a structure with the IP address. So for example, you give a structure containing four bytes, containing the four bytes of your IPv4 address. Now, of course, today you also have IPv6. So note that there are separate SOC adder in 6 and AF INET 6 types here for your socket calls and for your SOC adder types in order to uh, use IPv6 and this is needed because for example the protocols are different between v4 and v6 and also the addresses in IPv6 are much longer than your IPv4 addresses. So for sockets you can have uh, unreliable and reliable communication. Let's take a look at unreliable communication first. These are called datagram sockets. These don't require any connection setup. You can just send a datagram to a socket using the send to system call and you pass the file descriptor for the socket you created. Then you pass the pointer to a buffer containing a message and an indication of the length. Then you pass uh, any flags related to that message. And then finally, you need another socket address to indicate the destination. So which other uh, system do you want to send your message to? So IP address, family plus port number. And uh, you, get, you give the length, length of that buffer here as the final parameter here. And you can receive a datagram using the receive from function here, uh, which works in mostly the same way. So you have to allocate a buffer first. And whenever a message is received from that address here, it's written by the operating system in your buffer and your receive function actually returns. For stream oriented communication, you use stream sockets. These require a setup of, connection, of a connection because the computer needs to know that we have set up a connection and when it's terminated. Uh, so we have usually a client and a server in such a socket uh, stream socket setup here. So a client user process usually wants to communicate. Uh, so it wants to create a communication connection to a server or server process on a different machine. So the client has to do additional steps. It has to set up a connection to the server. And this is done using the connect system call. So this again gets passed an integer uh, indicating which socket we are going to use, the address in a struct, so struct socket adder, and the length of that address. And then we can send and receive over that socket using the read and write system calls uh, for files. Or there's also specific send and receive system calls, which mostly do the same thing. And we can terminate a connection using the close system call, which closes the socket again. Now on the server side, you have to be able to accept requests from clients. So a server needs to bind a socket to an address here. So the computer knows uh, that this service is available here. Otherwise, it's not reachable. And the server has to prepare the socket for connection requests using the listen system call. So essentially, it tells uh, our operating system that it wants to listen uh, to a certain connection here. And when uh, the listen system call indicates, OK, uh, we, we can listen to this because we've allocated a port number, for example, port 80 for a web server. This was free, so we're connected to this port number. Our server can then try to accept the connection using the accept system call here, uh, which returns a new socket, which is connected to the client. 
and if there's no current connection request it just blocks and then finally you can read data using read from the socket and execute the respective service so for example if a request comes in over the web over a port 80 tcp connection it can deliver a web page uh, by returning the result back to the sender using a write system call to that new socket and when it has delivered your web page it can close this new socket connection again using the close system call so here's a bit of a simple example for socket programming and this is actually a very very primitive web server so we start by defining a port let's say our web server is available at port 6789 so we're not using port 80 here because if you use ports lower than 1024 these ports are reserved for system use so only the super user can actually start a process that uses a port with a number uh, lower than 1024 so we use one above 1024 which we can actually access as a normal user here and then we have some maximum request size of like four megabytes here defined for defining a buffer so we declare a buffer a body and a message character array here each containing this information uh, of uh, up to four megabytes here and we have some error function here which just prints the error and exits our program yeah. So uh, in our main function, we need uh, file descriptors for our initial socket and for a new socket we are obtaining from our accept system calls. We have a uh, soc length type uh, for our connection here and we have soc headers for server and client here. And so the first thing we do is we call socket. We want our protocol family internet. We want a streaming socket, so a TCP IP connection. And we returned a file descriptor here. Now, if this return value is less than zero, we just complain we couldn't open the socket just because maybe we run out of sockets or we don't have any internet connection. Um, the next thing we do is we zero out our address here because uh, this is just uh, an element here which needs to be zeroed. And uh, then we set certain elements of uh, which we need. So we say it's an address family internet. So we want to not only use the internet protocol, but also internet addresses. You see, this is a bit redundant, obviously. Uh, we specify a connection address of any, which means we want to receive connections from all hosts on the internet. So from any arbitrary IP address. And uh, we pass a port number uh, of our port 6789. This has to be passed using this strange function h2ns. And this is a byte order function that actually converts your byte order which means uh, we've seen little and big endian byte order before. So if you have a little endian machine, you have to convert the byte order to big endian because big endian is what the internet actually uses. So this is actually H2NS, that's for host to network. So host byte order to network byte order and S stands for the size of the data type, which is a short, so it's a 16-bit number. So now we've set up our socket successfully. We in, uh, we already filled out our server address, so our struct sock adder, and now we can uh, pass this information to bind, so to indicate, okay, now we want to uh, bind to yeah any address uh, and uh, this given port 6789, mm -hmm. so after the successful return of our bind, uh, bind system call, uh, we know uh, our server is actually running at that port, and then we can start listening to that socket file descriptor here, which means we can try to accept connections. We tell the system, okay, please now open this port and accept connections for us. So on the second page of code, we can now finally handle requests after we set up the connection here. So uh, what we do here is we execute an accept system call on our socket uh, for client addresses. And uh, well, if this didn't work, we complain about the error otherwise we zero our buffer again and so when we successfully received the file descriptor here we can now read from this file descriptor as if it was a file so we can read from that buffer with the size of buffer minus one to indicate uh, first we need a terminating zero again and uh, in addition of course we don't want any buffer overruns so if our read system call complains then we have problems reading from the socket because maybe our client has dropped the connection in between but when we successfully read something from the socket, well, uh, what we do is uh, we actually ignore this request. The web server would now start parsing this request. Here, the only thing we do is return uh, we return a uh, simple web page here. 
by using a printf function printing to a string using sn printf. Uh, so this ensures that we don't get a buffer overrun by passing the size of, of, of that buffer here. And this just contains a string like uh, whatever uh, return and then hello web browser your request was and then just to confirm that we actually read that request here in our buffer we return the contents of that buffer here as part of our response and uh, what we also do is we print a message first for our header here so uh, in this header now we have to implement the HTTP protocol in a very primitive way. So this uh, is the standard reply uh, to our HTTP request, which means HTTP protocol 1.0. 200 is the error code, which indicates there's no error, everything's okay. And then our web browser actually wants some additional information, like what's the content of that page we're sending. So this is content type text, HTML, then this is contact lens. And finally, we send the string length of this message here. We're prepared to send back, so our web page here. And finally, we pass a pointer to that body as a string parameter. So the final message we sent is assembled here using a header here. And a header and body are separated actually by two new lines here. So there's an empty line between header and body. And directly after that header, we uh, copied our web page in. So what we do is rewrite this whole large string to our new socket here as the output and uh, then we close the socket because our connection is finished we have delivered our web page and when you try this in your browser it looks like this so you call for example localhost if you run it on the same machine 6789 but you could also do it from a different computer on your network and then it returns like hello web browser your request was and then the original request here from from my safari web browser uh, as you see, it's Macintosh, uh, and that's a lie. It wasn't an Intel Mac, it was an, an R Mac, so they didn't update this actually in Safari. Uh, so this is actually returned to indicate that we could actually read this. And so here you see the other side. So this is what your web browser sends to your web server as a request. So it tells, it has, it wants the web page at address slash, so at the root of our address using an HTTP protocol 1.1. It wants it from port number 6789 at localhost, and it accepts different kinds of formats like HTML text, some XHTML, and so on and so forth. And this is a Mozilla browser, and it's accepting English, and also zip packages, and so on. So essentially, this is a very simple and short example for network connection using sockets, but you could also do the same for example, on your local computer, for example, if you have a Linux machine running the X window system, connections between X window clients, so your application programs wanting to display graphics or text on the screen, and the X window server, so the program running on your system, uh, preparing uh, whatever interface to your graphics cards and, and drawing on your screen and so on. This is usually also re, uh, you, uh, done using sockets, but this on a local machine is using Unix domain sockets. What you can also do when you have the X window system running is you can redirect uh, the connection over TCP so you can have a program running on one machine, for example, on your cluster somewhere in your basement, and have the output a graphical window displayed on your local machine on your desk. And then this would use a TCP IP based socket connection, for example. So that's why sockets are so interesting here, because they enable you to be very flexible. So you don't have to rewrite your program, you just have to reconfigure the protocol and address family. One final approach to um, communication, message-based communication in computer systems we should talk about is also an approach that usually works over the network and that's called remote procedure calls or short RPCs. And these work similar like uh, to a function call between different processes. So uh, essentially when you do a function call, it's usually inside of your own process. So you use a function, you pass parameters, you expect a return value. And with RPC, you can do the same to a different process on your local machine. So you can call a function provided by a different process, pass it parameters, get a return value, or you could even do this over the network again. So this provides a very high grade of abstraction because it's a method that you can use as a programmer more or less to, to just call uh, something on a different machine like it was a function in your own program. Uh, this functionality is usually not directed or, uh, directly offered by the operating system because you need some sort of interception of these programming language function calls. So usually what's done is you use a library to map these calls to other communication forms, like for example, some of the message-based approaches we've seen before. 
You can map RPCs to multiple messages. So usually uh, when you call an RPC function, you send a request message. And then when this remote function is executed at the remote location, then it prepares the result and sends this back as a separate message again. Uh, and the response message, of course, then includes the results of this remote call. So from an application point of view, it looks just like uh, whatever process A or A is calling a function in process B. So it just looks like a function call and gets returned a result. But this is not happening directly because there may be an arbitrary connection in between. So what happens is that actually you need to generate so-called stops for all the functions in your process B that might be called remotely. So these stops have the same signatures as the original functions you would call, but instead of executing the functions, they actually transfer the parameters to a stop that actually behaves like process A. And this stop on the other machine or other in the other process passes it to our real function here. This returns our result to our stop. This result is returned to the other stop on the other side and finally to A. So essentially what we do is we redirect, we intercept that function call and pass it through whatever communication method is available. And this is very commonly used, for example, in the network file system using the open network computing RPC protocols, which are standardized, or also on a Linux system, for example, to pass around information uh, inside a uh, a single computer system using the so-called D-Bus or desktop bus communication system. Uh, for example, to pass around a clipboard buffer when you uh, have uh, just selected some text in one application and you want to pass it to another one. So this uh, lecture was all about IPC and we've seen two general classes of interprocess communication and today we've concentrated on message-based IPC where data is always copied and because we can copy data, this can also work between different computers and not only on a single computer. We can also communicate using shared memory. We haven't discussed this today in detail, but we have learned that Unix systems offer a number of different abstractions. So we've seen signals, pipes, sockets, and also message queues. And very often you would use sockets because they're a standardized and universal interface and almost all general purpose operating systems implement sockets so you can run socket-based communication also to a windows system for example from unix so you're not constrained to only using unix systems so that's all for today thanks for listening and until next time bye